Thank you, Cindy. It's, it's great to be here. It's great to be back. Uh, I didn't have this many people when I spoke when I was a CEO. Um, I think I once spoke to a room where there was one person and he was a vendor. Um, just sort of like being in a band and playing to nobody. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful to be here. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about open science and I'm going to be a little provocative because um, Sage is 10 years old this year. And so some of the things we want to talk about are the experiences we've had in open science uh, because we think that they're pretty representative of a lot of other people's experiences. Um, although I am only speaking for us at Sage in this talk. So I, I wanted to start with the ideology of open. Um, and I think that before I get into why I think open has turned into an ideology in the sciences, um, it's good to think about how we got to open science, uh, which I'd say, you know, it, it, there's a pretty easy trail to track. And so it's going to Vannevar Bush, if you've never heard of him, um, he dreamed the internet in 1946. He called it the Memex. He also wrote the memo to President Truman that more or less created the modern American scientific research enterprise. It was the, the foundation of the National Science Foundation. Um, and it was this whole idea that research would be neutral, it would be in the service of, of truth, it would be done through federal funding of basic research at universities and translated um, by the market to provide value back to American citizens. Um, it's kind of hard to find someone who wrote two more important papers than this guy right after World War II between Science the Boundless uh, Frontier, uh, sorry, sorry, Science the Endless Frontier, and As We May Live, which is where he laid out his vision for what became the internet. Um, it's also important to note that this wasn't unpolitical. And one of my points I'm gonna make today is that science is political, and what we do is political. Um, this, was, this vision of science was directly opposed to Lysenko, and Soviet genetics, right? This concept of neutral science was a political tool of the US government. And what it's led to is, right, the NIH, because I'm gonna talk about the life sciences here. I could talk about paleontology or astronomy or astrophysics, and a lot of people do. They're not real relevant to this. Um, and in particular, they're not real relevant to biology because they don't have to deal with patients, right? Or biological complexity, right? No one worries about dinosaur engagement in open paleontology. So the NIH, right, if you go to NIH, building one's tiny, but it's a campus, right, and it's grown massive over the time that it's been um, the center of biological research post-World War II. Research institutions, I'm pretty sure this is a picture of a university here. Uh, it's a stock image, right? Universities have gotten bigger as a result of this. The research business of universities is so well recognized at this point that uh, there is no research patent exception for doing research at a university because universities have been found by the Supreme Court to be in the business of research. And what did this make, for the most part, is it made papers, right? We've built an exquisitely tuned system for publishing, and this is a technical term, a shit ton of papers. <laughs> And this is kind of where open science starts to come from because, right, it's a form of massive incrementalism, right? You get a paper because you can publish something that has a certain amount of statistical confidence. You get a grant based on those papers. You don't get grants for fishing expeditions. And so what we reward is over and over and over creating slightly more knowledge than we had previously in the same small increments of papers. So Heather Piwar, who's an old friend of mine, did some calculation, right? So per $100,000, you get somewhere between 0.6 and 5 papers, right? And it rolls up to around 800,000 citations per year indexed in Medline, right? So why is there this push for open science? Because we're basically taking these tiny little incremental fragments of knowledge and locking them up in PDFs, right? That's the immune cause of the reaction for open in a lot of ways. Oh, I lost, a, lost my picture here. Oh, here we go. So what is massive incrementalism good at doing? It's good at creating pathway maps. Like we know a lot about this piece of Alzheimer's disease. If you dig in and click on the links inside the keg pathway, there's an incredible amount of knowledge. But we're kind of screwed when it comes to treating it. And so massive incrementalism is really good in the micro and kind of bad in the macro because it locks us into not questioning whether or not amyloid beta is the right way to go. Because anything other than amyloid beta for the last 20 years has been a fishing expedition. Because of course everyone knows that's what you need to do. 
Right? And it's these failures that created the opening that open science has sort of gone into. Right? It's, it's, this is where it comes from. And so it's the latest magic bullet. And I say the latest because it's not the first magic bullet. When I got into this, before I came to Tri-Conference in 2002, it was microarrays in 1999. Microarrays were going to fix everything. Right? Then it was the HGP was going to fix it. Then it was HatMap was going to fix it. Then it was RNAi. Then it was RNA-seq. Right? Like, there's a long list of magic bullets. And unlike most industries, pharma is actually willing to try radical restructuring. Right? Unlike the academic world, pharma is willing to go radical, not incremental. And so I remember reorganizations around therapeutic area, where each geographic piece of a pharma did a different part of the drug discovery process. I remember reorganizations around um, the therapeutic area, right? So you said this is, you know, this facility does neuro, that facility does immune, right? And none of it's worked, right? But what you get out of this is the open magic bullet. And so these are all things that I celebrate, right? I have spent my career more or less pushing for these kinds of things. I love them. I'm not like making fun of them. But these are evidence of the fact that open's kind of turned into the magic bullet that we think is going to fix stuff. And that to me is an ideological belief. It's not backed up by truth, right? But it's still important. So University of California has boycotted Elsevier, right? These are all from very recent, by the way. Uh, the Biden moonshot cancer plan calls for more data sharing, right? This is stuff that I dreamed about like 10 years ago. I see Eric Newman, I see Joanne, right? We've been begging for this for decades, right? And this is the memo that I didn't know Cindy was gonna announce me with that piece of my background. This is the memo that we petitioned for Right? These, this has gotten entrenched right? in, in kind of the idea of science. Just like Vannevar Bush was able to recast science around the method that he recast it around, those of us in the open movement have been pretty successful at recasting at least American and European science around open in a lot of ways. And so I love this idea of the official future. So Nils Gilman is a historian who, who I follow. And the idea is that the official future is how we collectively organize ourselves. And in politics, of course, we've killed the old official future, and now we're trying to figure out the new one. But in the sciences, I would argue that Vannevar Bush's future was the official future, and open science has wormed its way into it. And we're not all the way into the new official future, but the new official future involves openness and sharing and cloud and semantics and AI and knowledge management and all sorts of crazy stuff that wasn't part of the official future when I got into this in the late 90s. Right? We can't get away from it. And at SAGE, we kind of live in that future. We were founded 10 years ago. Um, this is our logo, I have to show it. Uh, we were a spin out of Merck. So originally SAGE was the Rosetta Informatics unit of Merck. Um, I wasn't there, I got involved and we spun it out and turned it into a new nonprofit. But we've spent 10 years trying to work in this intersection of cloud and open and sharing and collaboration and machine learning and all of these things. And so I'm gonna talk about some of the lessons that we've learned, um, some of the work that we've done, and then I'm gonna try to figure out and, and work maybe with you to think about what does it mean and where does it go. Um, so here's one example. This is one of the first ones we have. This is the Colorectal Cancer Subtyping Consortium. And this came from looking at four papers, right? Um, each of them claiming to have published the colorectal cancer molecular subtype four different subtypes and four different papers with four different methods on four different data sets from four different groups. How do we know which of these is more justified? How do we know whose claims are true and whose claims aren't? Um, and so after a fair amount of shuttle diplomacy, we convinced them to go from this sort of model where each expert team analyzes one data set to generate one subtype and said, what happens if every expert team can analyze all the collected data in one format? Um, what would happen? And so in order to do this, we had to promise each team its own paper for analyzing all of the data. So six new papers. And in return for that, we got a seventh paper, which is the consensus subtype. <laughs> right now, a normal way of doing this would have involved those labs writing letters to the editor and snarky comments maybe on well, Twitter wasn't even you know, uh, that much of a thing at this point. right? This short circuits the process of figuring out what are the most justified claims in each of those four papers. That's something that's pretty good about open science. Um, we also started working on analytical challenges. So this was, I don't know if those of you who've been around the open world remember, the idea was that the crowd will be smarter than you guys. The crowd will be smarter than the experts. 
Um, if we run these challenges, maybe the answers to cancer are lurking in the data and the bio IT informaticists simply aren't good enough to pull them out. That turns out not to be true, right? And um, this is, you know, whether you look at Kaggle, which has a million solvers, or our own work, which has maybe 10,000 or 12,000 solvers, for the most part, bioinformaticists are pretty good at reading their data. But what you have is the same kind of problem as you have in the colorectal cancer, which is that it's really hard to figure out which algorithm is better in which context. Um, and what you find out is that when you apply the same model where you say, we're going to take multiple models after a competitive phase and put them into a consensus model later, that you get a stronger model. And what you get is a benchmark. And so actually, the point of the challenge isn't to find the outlier miracle. It's to peer review things and say, if you can't beat the consensus benchmark, you shouldn't get into a publication. You shouldn't get into a regulatory conversation. You should be able to use these benchmarks inside a pharmaceutical company to help make decisions about which algorithms to use. And they need to be open or that won't happen. As we got a little further in, because it, it takes a while in, in bio to prove that your methods work. It's sort of like doing farming. Uh, it takes a couple of years to prove that a new method works compared to an old method. It's, it doesn't go at the speed of tech. And so after about four or five years, people started thinking maybe Sage is not completely full of it. Um, let's try an idea where we take this concept of, of collaboration, but instead of happening after publication or after competition, let's do it before publication and before competition. And this happened in Alzheimer's. It's not an accident that the pharma industry came in and put half of the money in with the NIH saying, well, if amyloid beta is wrong, then we don't want to just randomly choose another core target set. We want to have some sort of process to rigorously figure out what are the best targets to take forward and is there a methodological way that we can de-risk this, right? And so here's the total amount of money. The, 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 it's pretty much even between uh, pharma and NIH and the original money went to six labs. And the idea was uh, basically you would have everyone doing target discovery but using radically different methods. So you have one lab doing machine learning, you have one lab doing proteomics, you have one lab do, doing systems biology, and on and on. Different fundamental methods for finding targets, but have them all in the same technical platform, using the same data standards and the same data names and the same workbooks. And then before you decide whether or not to go forward, you would look at all this data at the same time. Um, and then this would all publish out to a portal. So this is our, 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 our graphic from the very beginning, and you see it was Broad Rush, right, Florida, ISB Mayo, Mount Sinai, Emory, Sage, and a few other partners. And so this is what we drew in our grant application, right? and this is what's in it now. And so these are, the, these are the data sets by type, going from ROSMAP up at the top, which has 21,000 plus data sets, all the way down to, you know, some of the more rare data sets at the bottom. But if you build it, they won't come. Right? It's not like this data is massively reused. Right? This is something else that we've learned is that the value is in the community that generated that data. So it's not about growing the data sets, although it's fun to show these. The value is in the fact that the AMP AD project now has three other networks that have joined it. So you have a molecular mechanism network, you have a mouse model network, and you have a resilience network that have all been added to the same conceptual platform. Right? You have vector tools, mouse models, non-digital things that are now accessible through the same sort of consortium. Right. And I'm gonna actually come back to this in a second um, when I go into the, the sort of the impact is that suddenly you have the ability to say, is one lab's discovery of a target more or less justified than another lab's? And if a lab, if, if the same discovery comes out of two labs that don't talk to each other and that have radically different methodologies, the odds of that being noise are much lower. And then maybe four years ago, five years ago, we started to move outside of this and say, you know what, we're discovering we can't actually reuse the data that we're getting our hands on. For the most part, we're getting access to data that we have to treat as trade secrets. And we started untangling the sweater and we got all the way up. We said, well, we actually need to be in charge of the clinical protocol. Because if you can't put the clinical protocol in your own hands, then you can't consent the data in a way that allows it to be broadly used. And we didn't have the money to run studies like institutions run studies. And none of the institutions we worked with wanted to do the things that we wanted to do. They didn't want to have open consent. They didn't want to give the data back. They didn't want to put the data into these communities and these challenges. And so the only way we could do this was to go to mobile phones and start doing studies ourselves directly on handsets. So we were fortunate. We were Apple's launch partner for ResearchKit. 
This meant that we did a lot of the back-end IT work on providing the, the, the databases and the systems that actually ran the study, as well as some of the initial study designs and protocols. Um, this is the kind of thing that you can test with something like Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's is a remarkably good phenotype to do this on because you can use the sensors in the phone to really get at the phenotype. So the same sensors that let you do landscape and portrait let you track tremor, right? In the pocket, in a gait test, uh, the microphone, the touch screen. You can do an awful lot with the sensors on a phone to actually sense something like neurodegeneration over time. Um, and it was great, right? We had really good enrollment numbers. Uh, I will tell you that engagement drops off a cliff after 30 days because that's what happens on phones. Studies are not immune to the rules of gravity of mobile applications. Uh, but you can get an enormous amount of data this way and you can consent it directly, and I'll talk about this, in a way that lets you share the data more broadly in a downstream context. Um, but it starts to explode the data available to you in interesting ways. So you go from something like dyskinesia where you would count the number of taps or maybe even you would just say on a scale of one to five, John's a three today. And you go to all these different dimensions that you can suddenly capture about something like Parkinson's disease. And what it lets you find are some invisible impacts that might not have been visible because of the way we generated the clinical measures, which in this case was mainly around men. So the, the old school, right, number of taps, mean tapping and median for the 62-year-old man, right, and I know you can't see this, I apologize. I think this is a, no, that's not it. But uh, that's what you've got up here at the top. Now on the right, we have a woman who's slightly older. You would not have found her through the raw number of taps because she wasn't getting an increase in the number of taps she could come up with. Her accuracy was getting better. And so if you couldn't measure this, you might take her off L-DOPA. And it starts to show, like as you get into this, what's possible. It also starts to raise some interesting questions about privacy and equity and fairness and justice. Right? If these new systems are capable of revealing these sorts of things, maybe they ought to have to reveal those kinds of things. And we have to start thinking about the justice and the fairness to the people that actually enroll in these studies. We have to meet them where they live, because otherwise they'll delete the app from their phone. And you also start to find something that's invisible when you're just waiting for people to come into a structured health context and give you data. So this is one person over time with their Parkinson's, just the tapping test. And this is actually a picture of a hypothesis. And so the hypothesis is that something happens about a third of the way through. A long red arrow going up is where the person tapping numbers before they took their meds went up after they took their meds. So the bottom data point is pre-med, the bottom data point is post-med on any one given day. So something happened in the middle that disturbed the relatively steady benefit that this person got from their meds. They have days where they got worse after they took their meds and they have days where they barely completed the tasks and we just have dots. And then something stabilized back again. Right, so this, again, starts to point out interesting things that come from doing right, science and these new methodologies, but it starts to create a lot of questions about what's our obligation? Should we connect with these people? How much do we tell them about this? When do we trigger the FDA if we tell them about this? Right, because the FDA regs were not written with this in mind. And through all of this, right, still no magic bullets. Right, so the way that we've been doing open science has not meaningfully changed the number of drugs that come out per billion dollars invested. Right, we still have, you know, I first heard this from Bernard Munoz, this concept of E-Room's law, which is the exact opposite of Moore's law. Right, Moore's law goes this way, the other way. Right, it goes up. And this gets at sort of the, the, why, the point of why I wanted to give this talk is that, that it's great to talk about open science and I'm very proud of the work that we've done and I want to continue it, but when we talk about impact, this is what patients think impact is. Right, are there new medicines? Is there an impact on my day-to-day -day life, right? And, and we haven't gotten there yet. Right. And so this is sort of what we learned at SAGE. We have this great phrase, the reality was less straightforward than we thought. And that's pretty true for almost any kind of science. And, and so you wind up having to improvise and figure things out. And so rather than trying to think about is open science a definition or a purity test that we have to really push towards, we've started to try to think of it as a suite of methods that anyone can use. Right? These can be used in the pursuit of a closed process. They can be used in pursuit of an open process. These are just good ways to do science. They'll work a lot better if you're open, right? But they're fundamentally a set of methods and not something we judge a score on that says how many of your files are on the internet. So one of the first ones is this triangulate to better bets. So I, I showed AMP AD. This is where it's going now is there's actually now a grant out, a U54, for a discovery of new medicines. 
So taking the same concept for targets and applying it to leads. Can we generate lead targets that are in the public domain and can then be optimized so that you radically increase the speed to which people are testing out side chains? And they're building those directly against the wall of targets that came out of AMP AD. So the genes and the proteins that got the most upvotes from the most labs are going to be at the top of the target list for this new grant. Right. And this triangulation, this idea that if, if, a, if a gene was on the wall of targets from one lab, we're going to rank it lower than a gene that's on the wall of targets from three labs, is at the heart of this. It's got more justification. Right. This idea of a benchmark is peer review. I showed the Parkinson's data. We didn't even know how to analyze it. Right. We got a hold of it. It was like, oh, this is great. And after like six months, we said, you know what? We should probably run a challenge just to figure out the methods because it's so easy to hack through Parkinson's sensor data and get a meaningful signal that's not meaningful. If your goal is publication, that's one thing. If your goal is truth, it's another. Because I don't know if you're walking weird because your Parkinson's is bad today or because you're walking on cobblestones in Boston. And you need methods that can distinguish these things. Because the data were consented and open, this is where the contestants came from, right? You do get experts from all over the world. So you might not want that one in a million, but in the original work on crowdsourcing that Surowiki did, it wasn't about the wisdom of the crowds finding you the one brilliant lone outlier. It was about the consensus of the agriculturist guessing the weight of the pig, the fair, being more accurate than any one individual. And so that's what this lets you do, is to get a larger and larger number of experts. And it's incredibly powerful as a way to do benchmarking. And some of these researchers came from classic, typical academic and pharmaceutical places. Some of them came from technology companies like Apple and Verily and Intel. And they came from citizen scientists around the world. We've also learned a lot that you can't open everything. So we ran across a data set of 700,000 plus um, mammograms, right? We ran across a data set of lots and lots of multiple myeloma data that weren't consented for open sharing. And so you say, well, what can you do with something like Docker or with container technologies? You can actually bring people to the data instead of sending the data to them. This lets you share things that are theoretically unshareable, but it violates all the precepts of open because most of the open precepts assume that it's the status of the file that dictates it as opposed to the usage that's done. So in this traditional sense, right, I would have to send you the data. In a cloud world, that's nuts because I get killed by success. So I'm paying your data transfer fees on Amazon. The more of you that use it, the more bankrupt we go as an organization. Right? And the larger the data get, think about the black hole that we just saw. They literally flew the hard drives on a plane because data transfer would have taken so long. That's where this is going. So this is another methodology for making data more available that's incredibly powerful. It allows you to take data that is too sensitive or that could be harmful and make it accessible for use in a very broad fashion. You also have to keep pushing on institutions. So this is part of the political work. This is the Center for Data to Health. It's a CTSA effort coming out of NCATS, which is trying to actually get the CTSAs to play nice together, share data, and do collaborative science. Right? You can't just sort of give up on pushing on the institutions just because it's hard. It's part of the answer. Um, and the whole idea is to bring together the whole suite of omics, ontology, standards, tools, trials, Right? But to do this not through mandates, but to do it through projects. Say, is there a project that needs data sharing across 10 CTSAs or 5 CTSAs? Get it running, make it useful enough that everyone feels like they need to join it. It's a much faster way to get a network effect than to try to mandate everyone, you know, 50 institutions at once to magically adopt a standard. I've never yet seen that happen. And the idea is little networks become big networks over time. When it comes to these mobile studies, like everyone wants to increase enrollment. Everyone wants to use dark patterns as soon as they have trouble with enrollment and engagement. And so a dark pattern is a design approach that tricks you into doing something you don't want to do. If you've ever clicked the confirm button when you meant to click the cancel button, that's a dark pattern. They're everywhere. They dominate social engagement in particular. And a lot of it comes from the way that we physically read. So this is just an example. These are eye gaze patterns looking at text. And so we read in what's called the F shape. Right, we read down and across in very structured ways, and websites and apps take advantage of this. Uh, but the reality is we don't read very many of the words on the screen. Look at all the words behind the heat maps. Those are words that no one's reading. If you do this with an informed consent document, it's kind of hard to say that you had informed consent. Right? So you've got to build designs that account for that that actually slow people down and make them pay attention to things. 
There's another element you have to deal with, which is that we're all socially conditioned to just click OK on like whatever is in front of us. Um, I could use any number of examples. My favorite is the one where people gave away their firstborn child in exchange for free Wi-Fi. Um, there's another one in the UK where you signed up for a thousand hours of cleaning the sewers, right? People don't read legal documents on their screens. They've become conditioned because of software click wraps to just click OK. And we don't want either a data donor or a data user to do that because we're gonna create extra risks for the data donor because we're gonna share the data. And we're gonna create extra obligations for the data user because we expect them to behave according to certain norms. So whichever those are, we've gotta actually slow them down. So we call this participant-centered consent. Right? It uses a, a mixture of an icon, a headline, and a subheadline. These are quantitatively and qualitatively shown to show down, slow down eye gaze fixation to something that's similar to the speed of print. We also give people the choice, right? Only share my data with the people running the study or donate it to qualified researchers worldwide. Right? We don't set the preference for them. They have to set the preference with no sort of hint as to what to get. Just as a data point, um, on the 20 or so studies where we've run this, about 70% of people consistently choose to donate their data to science worldwide. You also have to leverage developer culture, right? So the reason that this has been successful inside Apple's ResearchKit platform is because Apple put it into ResearchKit. We put it into GitHub, Apple put it into ResearchKit and gave developers instructions how to do it, right? And then suddenly you have developers who are simply picking this up because it's in the kit. It never occurs to them to do anything other than what's in the application development framework. So this is, you know, you can herd cats or you can get all the way upstream to where the cats live and put vitamins and vaccines in their milk. And you have to do all of these things if you want to have an impact because all it takes is one break in the chain. Right? All it takes is one crappy piece of code baked into an app that somebody grabbed from GitHub that they weren't thinking about and the data is leaking and spraying. And your trust is gone. Right? All of this sort of nascent stuff is really easy to lose. It's really hard to build, really easy to lose. And so this is one of the things we've been thinking about over the last decade is, you know, what's this for? Because when we talk to people in open science, some of them care about you know, replication, some of them care about inclusion, you know, there's this really radically different group of reasons why people believe in open science and promote open science. And as we think through what's actually worked over this last decade, we think it's important to actually talk about why we do it, why we do it at SAGE. I don't know why everyone else does it, right? But this is why we do it. Um, and, and it really comes around the word just. And so just, you know, in two senses, right? I've been talking about justification a lot, right? Justification is, you know, what differentiates a belief from knowledge. Right? That's why we do science. That's why we peer review it. And so transparency increases justification. Right? If it took me 130 versions of the experiment and it worked once, and I get a nature paper, it's very different than if someone else ran the same experiment 20 times and got the same experiment 20 times. But we can't see that, and we assign both papers equal justification because they're nature papers. Right? Transparency increases that. Right? Replication increases justification. It's expensive as hell and it doesn't work all the time and there's all sorts of non-evil reasons why replication doesn't always work, but when we can replicate, we can feel more confident that it's a justified claim. Right? Registration increases justification. Did you get the result you wanted to get or did you change the result you wanted after you saw your data? Right? Not that that's necessarily bad, right? but again, it helps us understand the justification of the claims in the experimental design. And triangulation increases justification, as I've talked about. And so these are important, right? This is where I started from 15 or so years ago, was really around justification. This idea that we needed to know what we knew. But as I've gotten farther into this, I've gotten more concerned with justice. Because it's the other piece that just comes to. So um, this is the funny slide I start with, which is Labradoodles versus fried chicken. <laughs> right? AI isn't very good at distinguishing these things. <laughs> it's not. Because it's not people. It doesn't understand that one's a dog and one's a food. Right? They have similar colors. They have similar shapes. Right? This is exactly the kind of thing that fools AI. And the reason I start with this is because it's funny, but it's not funny. Right? It's a data problem. Algorithms are fed right, by certain images in this context, and they're chosen by engineers, and if the system is trained on people that are overwhelmingly white, it has a harder time recognizing non-white folks. And this has a real-world impact, and it's gonna happen in health, right? So, it's Google Photos, right? 
Nikon photos, criminal justice. This stuff's happening fast, right? The machine thinks the gentleman who's black is more likely to recur a crime than the gentleman who's white, and the machine's wrong, right? And this is where we're headed in health if we don't attack the justice piece of this. And open data is one of the only tools we've got because the people who are creating the data are creating data that looks like them. Um, since we're in Boston, right, I used to live here, I love this city. Um, these are Amazon same-day delivery maps before Amazon took race into consideration with their delivery maps. That white hole in the middle of Boston, Roxbury. That's the only place that did not have same-day delivery in the Boston metro area. That was race blind. It just happened to find race because race is so heavily coordinated, correlated with economics. So there's a justice problem as we move towards an AI and an ML world in the life sciences that, that we have to engage with. And if we count on sort of the old ways of doing open and just sort of looking for you know, rich volunteers from the internet, we're gonna exacerbate this. So I've been critiqued by people in the open science movement for, for saying this, so I'd say let people share DNA with a click, right? I don't really think we should be letting, in 2019, Facebook be our design inspiration. I'm also not sure that we want the government in charge of our consent for our data, right? But this is an argument that's out there in the open science movement. Just put the genomes in the public domain and everything will shake itself out. And I don't think it will, you know? We don't have anti-discrimination legislation in this country that's meaningful. We have legislation that covers health insurance discrimination, but not life disability, long-term care, education, or employment discrimination based on DNA. So if you donate your data to science, right, you're not just putting yourself at risk for this, you're putting your family at risk for this, your cousins, your nieces and nephews. Right? There's a justice issue in open science that we often don't engage with. And this is the other part as we move towards precision medicine. Right? The thing about these things is they're felt by people who aren't wealthy or white, but they come for all of us because the same tools that allow precision treatment of me allow me to be surveilled and identified in a negative sense. Sort of by definition, that's what precision means. And it's not even just your DNA. One of my favorite examples is this red solo cup. I have a friend who was at medical school and wanted to do an alcoholism study and couldn't get IRB approval in time. So he friended a thousand undergrads on Facebook and he looked for the specific color of this cup. And he figured out at what time the pictures were posted, looked for typos in the text underneath those, and was able to build an epidemiological map of alcohol abuse at his university in about a week. <laughs> right? Because this is, I mean, it's pretty easy to see once you see it. Because it's no longer that this is health data that we can protect easily through regulation. Say, well, don't do that to health data. This wasn't health data. The query turned it into health data. Right? And that's all it takes. And so we have to have this conversation, right? Like, if I'm gonna be out here promoting open science and saying you should donate your data to research in my study and I'm not engaging with the fact that real harms can come to real people from it, I'm kind of a jerk. You know? And it's, it's easy to get lost in all of the cool stuff we can do and forget that you know, in 2019, if you're building tech and you're not engaging with the harms it can create, right? You should take a look in the mirror because these systems are, are every day repurposed in ways that are unfair and hurt people. And that's not, I think, why we're in this, right? You know, this is not an advertising conference. This is a conference that's trying to make people better. You know, but these are the side effects of the world that we live in. So what can you do if you try to put it together at scale? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the All of Us Research Program. Um, so this came out of the Precision Medicine Initiative under the previous administration. Idea is collect a million people, follow them for a decade. We're close to Framingham, so I can sort of, you guys will actually get this, right? This is the Framingham study of the 21st century. A million people for a decade, right? Full electronic medical records, surveys, linked data, right? So environmental data, social determinants of health, census data, right? Everything. Physical exam, blood, urine, wearables, right? For a decade. Uh, with sequencing, eventually, we hope to start sequencing later this year of the first initial pilot. Um, so this is way more complicated than that little Parkinson's app that I showed you. And at Sage, we're very fortunate, and I'm biased. You should discount for the fact that we're an awardee. We got the award to write the clinical protocol, 
and we got the award to do the informed consent as well as some digital health work for this study. Um, we also make a point of giving back everyone their data. If you're in the study, you'll get all of your data back. And so this is what the protocol looks like. It's, we've published a 70-page summary of the protocol, right? So you can see how hard it is. We have hundreds and hundreds of awardees, hundreds and hundreds of sites. All of them have to run off a common protocol on a single national central IRB, right? This is complicated stuff. It requires thinking of the protocol as a platform that has plugins for all of the sites. I'm really proud of the work that we've done on this because we've spent a lot of time trying to say, how do you translate gauzy ideals into an actual piece of clinical protocol? Because it's really easy to commit to principles. It's very hard to translate them into running code when you actually have to actually go out and enroll people on physical sites. How do you do that? The protocol is where the rubber meets the road. Um, this is the kind of tech you have to use. We're talking about bioIT. Don't be afraid to use tech to do things like manage your clinical protocols. Here's how we track amendments and versions of our core protocol. Right? The protocol is a piece of software. It's an operating system for the study. It needs version control. Right? You have to think about these things at every layer if you want to do these things at scale or you wind up crushing yourself under technical debt really quickly. The consent is a little more complex. Obviously, we can't get into the same sorts of simplistic things as, a, as, a, as a, the Parkinson's app because we're actually going to take your DNA. So we have videos, we've written everything at the fifth grade level or below, because if you don't know, a third of the country reads at or below the fifth grade level. And if you're gonna reach out to underrepresented populations, which is another goal of this study, um, you have to reach out to everyone where they are, because representation isn't just a matter of gender or ethnicity, it's a matter of education, geography, income. And a little bit of data, right, does the consent process work? from an inform informing perspective. We know it works from a consenting perspective because we've enrolled about 130,000 people completely in the study and we've consented almost 190,000 people. But here's some data that says, do they understand it? Right, so this is therapeutic misconception um, across education. Green is the answer we want. Right, yellow is the answer we don't want. Orange is chose not to respond. Right. Same stuff by ethnicity, right? And again, what you see is green is the, and I'm sorry for the, the coloration for anyone who's colorblind. Um, we have the, the help scientists discover. You see these numbers are really high. For comparisons, the best data we can find is that on average, three out of five people fail this question in most informed consent interactions. Right, so we go from 40% completion to high 80s, low 90% completion. Next question, is it voluntary or required? Same, same trends. Right? Again, consistent across race and ethnicity. Can I withdraw? Right? And these are the questions that design interviews revealed patients cared the most about, what, knowing whether or not they could do this. Again, remarkable across education, remarkable across race and ethnicity. Now, this is the question we did worse on, right? which is, and we wrote it badly. This is where we broke our own rules. This question does not read at a fifth grade level, and it involves concepts um, like guarantee and privacy. Um, that aren't defined or implicit in the, in the question. So we have a much higher um, deviation across education in this answer. We're in the middle of rewriting it and submitting it to the IRB in hopes that we'll actually uh, figure out whether or not it's the way we wrote the question or if we got the consent materials themselves wrong. And you see the same kind of variation, including a really 27% uh, um, mistake in the American Indian Alaska Native population. So we're doing some extra ethnography in those groups to figure out what we did wrong. But these are the kinds of things you can achieve at scale, right? Like, I'm not sure anyone's ever shown data from 150,000 to 200,000 people on consent, right? And I've only got 89,000 in this data set, but the data stay pretty stable as we go. So what we see is at least this part of what we do can actually move the needle on something like informed part of informed consent. And from a perspective of were we successful in rolling underrepresented populations, yeah. Right? Out of the numbers that I showed you, half of the, half of the people total uh, were from underrepresented populations. Uh, that number's up to 70%. Right? This is doable, right? Justice and justification are possible, right? But you really have to be intentional about it because if you're not intentional about it, it's really easy to slip back into the same structures and systems that have excluded people from the sciences. And a little later this year, you'll be able to go to the research portal and start playing with the data. So the EHR data is being loaded up. It's an OMOP. That may make some of you happy and some of you unhappy, but at least it's in one format, right? It's being sent through ETL from all of the health provider organizations in a standard quarterly dump. 
you'll be able to go in and slice it and dice it pretty much any way you want. Um, and the sequencing and the blood assay data will start to come in in the fourth quarter and the first quarter of next year. Now, this is a key point. This is in a private cloud where you log in and do the work. It's a model to data approach instead of a data download approach because, again, if we make this data downloadable, we can't keep the promises we made to the participants that we would do everything we could to keep them from being hurt. But it's not open, right, in the ideological sense of open because you can't redistribute it, you can't copy it, you can't download it. But it's accessible. It's fair and it's just. So I'm almost done and thank you for listening. Um, where does this all go, right? So I think, you know, we, we, you can't ignore the idea of massive incrementalism, right? This is how I think about electronic health records, right? You go from my ear is useful, I will have an ear horn, I will have a larger ear horn, I will have an enormous ear horn. This is epic, right? Right. And I, I don't think this is on the table. I think we're facing too many biological crises at the same time for this to be on the table. Um, the popular option right now is the stacks, right? So the stacks, if you've never heard this phrase, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, right? The Fang stacks. Or if you're in China, right? Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. Right? These groups are dominant, and in many ways, uh, my, my thinking on them is formed by this book, The Stack. Uh, Bruce Sterling also calls them The Stacks because they're, they're vertically integrated. They want to take over large chunks of your digital life, and they really depend on keeping you in their ecosystem to build as three-dimensional a data picture of you as they can. And if you go back to the original versions of the Internet, this is from one of the first papers that led to the Internet, um, the idea was to build a distributed network because a centralized network was dangerous. Right, a single point of failure. Um, the stack world has rebuilt the thing the Internet's founders didn't want, which is, you know, you can get any color you want as long as it's Google. Right? This is where it's going to go absent intervention. And so this is why, you know, despite all the sort of caveats I have for open science, I think it's an important part of the official future because it's part of how we avoid everything being owned by a very small number of monopoly centralized networks. And so to me, the answer is also in network theory, which is compatible communication among groups. Metcalfe's law of network effects has to do with compatible communication. And so these networks look much more stable to me. And so I don't think we're gonna wind up looking fully distributed. The reality is that hubs are useful, right? I flew here from Washington today. I'm gonna fly through Chicago tomorrow. Hub and spoke systems are stable. Right? They're found in biology in lots of places. Right? They're stable against random knockout of nodes in a way that centralized networks aren't. And they provide network effects and economies of scale in a way that distributed networks don't. But you know, the answer is going to have to come from an intentional way of how we do this, because I don't think it's us as individual scientists. Right? The value that I just talked about right, comes from communities. This is Eleanor Ostrom. She won the Nobel in economics for her work showing that communities were able to solve problems that neither markets nor governments could solve. Now, there's an upper limit on how big those communities can get before they start looking like Facebook, which, of course, says it's a community. Right? But Ostrom was able to show over and over again that if you gave the community the tools to govern itself, that it could solve its own problems. It's this wonderful, beautiful thing. Right? It's the opposite of the tragedy of the commons which, of course, if you go back and read it, was a thought experiment. And Eleanor won the Nobel for actual experiments that showed it wasn't true most of the time. That the conditions under which you create the tragedy of the commons were anonymity and failure to communicate. So the lesson here is, right, open methodologies are really important, and I've had fun talking about them, but the communities that use them to govern themselves are the source of the innovation. They are the place that generate the benchmarks, the walls of targets, right? the new leads, are the communities. And so the communities are the unit of governance that I think we should be looking at and we should be talking about what happens if those communities are on the same platforms. What if they use the same data standards, the same knowledge management systems, and they can form networks amongst each other. Because right? those are networks that are not controlled and in some ways not controllable. Right. But the platforms they run on need to be more like utilities, more like phones used to be and electricity used to be before we deregulated them. And I tried to figure out how to phrase the last one, but anti-discrimination is the best I can come up with. Right. Social justice and anti-discrimination has to be a piece of this or we're going to wind up building a system that doesn't help the people on whose backs it's built. 
And so if you can take one thing away of what I want you to think about is I want you to think about more just science. We don't just need more science, we need more just science. And that's something that I think we can engage the public with, it's something I think we can engage the policymakers with, and it's something that doesn't force us to wipe away all the institutions of science, because I think those institutions are very valuable. Right? But we can't keep doing it the way we've been doing it and hope that open fixes it. Open isn't something we bolt on to a broken system and then hope it makes it better. Open has to be from the very beginning baked into it, but so does justice. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you.